Hello! How's it going? I missed you all last week. I have to apologise, I didn't put out a podcast. Um, the reason being, last week was Harry's birthday. I can't believe that boy is one. I have a one-year-old. Can you even believe it? I can't believe it. It feels like only yesterday that I brought him home from the hospital and I did a podcast with Harry on my lap, basically saying surprise I have a baby so (laughs) it's been a journey but the other thing was is that I arranged for all of Chris's family to fly in as a surprise as well so his parents came in his uh, sister and her oldest daughter came in and his brother his brother's wife and our two nephews came in as well um, as well as having quite a big party for him So, it was chaos in this house. Everybody stayed here. I love having a full house. I'm not going to lie. I love having a full house. I like people coming over and visiting us. Um, But it's too much to record a podcast in. (laughs) It's it's long and short of it. There would be absolutely no way I had any quiet time to be able to record a podcast. And Harry was sleeping in my podcast studio come closet. So, um, yeah, uh, there was no, there was nowhere quiet for me to to record a podcast. That's okay though, because we put out last week our first rising above the noise, which is a roundup of everything that's going on at NC Real Estate, what we're seeing in a month, how we're operating, how everything is changing in the industry, and what we're doing about it. And also what we are looking at in terms of property types. I know for a fact this past week we've gone in to offer on three properties. None of them are below 650. Our sweet spot for finding commercial properties at the moment is 650 to a million. That's really where we're finding some really really good deals that's not to say there's anything below that but when we're looking at asset management our clients have big income goals and whilst I know that a lot of people are really worried about putting all their eggs in one basket and thinking well if I've only got one property it's a massive risk um I don't want to buy the big properties I want multiple small properties in all honesty, you want to be aiming for a property portfolio of four to five properties. Why do you want any more than that? It's just such a headache to manage and all the moving parts. Um, and if you can afford those bigger properties in those higher price ranges, that's going to get you to your money goals quicker than buying loads and loads and loads of piddly small properties. Now, I have loads of small properties. I also have big properties. So uh, I mix from the 500,000 mark in my portfolio all the way down to the 150,000 pound mark that's fine but I am only 33 years old and so I have got time to amalgamate into bigger properties and trust me that's what I'm going to be doing there is absolutely no way I need management headaches for the rest of my life once I decide that it's good enough to retire Hell no, do I want a load of properties. But um, communicating that with my clients is a really big thing at the moment and how, you know, you have got the best in the business in NC Real Estate looking after your properties and we will do everything we possibly can to make that property a success. So give us that opportunity to do it with a, f- with a few properties and make it really work. There's no way we want vacant properties at the moment. Absolutely no way. And so we are busting a gut to get all these properties let, working with local agents on the ground. And so that's what we've been focusing on. And if you read Rising Above the Noise, our newsletter that comes out on the first of each month, that will show you exactly what we're working on, how we're doing it. And also all of the cool things that go on in the members club on a monthly basis, all of the deals we talk about. Um, on Thursday night we did this epic deal analysis into a multi-let office building in 
leads and we went through all the tranches of the income that was coming in and we put, did a deal appraisal based upon the fact that the Bank of England base rate had just gone up to 4%, uh, mortgage lending was changing and where we'd be offering and that's the kind of thing we do in the members club as well. So that is is all packed into rising above the noise. If you are a members club subscriber, you get the whole thing. If you are just on our newsletter, you get a snapshot into what we're doing. So make sure that you're reading our newsletter and you get in there with all of that. It is an absolute beaut headed up by Steve Wallace on our team who puts that all together. So it is fabulous, love it. Um, what else happened this week? Oh my gosh, Texas had an ice storm. You guys, I, I'm not going to lie, I was having a bit of a miserable week. That is mindset stuff, nothing to do with the fact that anything was really going wrong. Um, I have been doing a lot of juggling, as has Chris, my husband, and that we've had Harry home now, not a daycare, for four weeks. At first it was because he was ill, so that's absolutely fine. But then uh, our daycare made it stricter in terms of ill, so any lingering cough, she didn't want him in. <sighs> any lingering running nose, even though our uh, doctor had said, no, the running nose is due to teething, she wouldn't have him in, so we've had him home and home and home, which means that I've been working four hours in the morning, Chris has been doing four hours in the afternoon, and we have literally just been cobbling everything together to try and get everything done. I'm a perfectionist. I want everything to be running smooth. I want to feel like I'm on the ball and I've just felt like I've been one step behind for a couple of weeks. So then it was Harry's birthday. We had a fabulous time. Family was visiting. Uh, we were on a high. We were excited. Yes, it was the start of February. Everything was going to go back to normal. And then we had an ice storm what <laughs> I didn't believe it at first on Tuesday when the whole state closed down it was zero degrees and raining and I was like what is this why is everything closed for zero degrees and raining overnight on Tuesday the world became ice and when I say world I just mean Texas my immediate world and everything froze not snow ice a really big accumulation of ice trees had come down in our garden the new sail that we'd had to put in for our pool was just uh, almost broken with the weight of the ice our car had frozen to the driveway it was chaos uh, and going out was dangerous because all of the trees were so covered in ice that we couldn't get out and so for the last couple of days, we have been dealing with that. I was just not aware of how quickly ice could cause trees to snap. And so our road was impassable. In fact, our neighbourhood was impassable. If you went out, you couldn't get along the pavements because trees had collapsed. Our neighbours three doors down and had three of their trees down over their house. They were trying to reverse their car into the tree to get it to move. It was chaos. Then on Thursday, I was sat on an asset management call with a client and I looked out the window and I just saw half our tree collapse into the drive and I had to put that call on hold as I just said I have to go mo try and move our car so there's me in the guard in the driveway like trying to like get this car to open up because it was still frozen shut like trying to bang it but without breaking the windows um, eventually I got into one of the doors at the back and warmed that car up slightly and just got it in the garage it with inches to spare. Our gar garage does fit two cars in, but um, I've been decorating some outside ornaments in the garage at the moment. So I had all my paint stuff all over the place and all of these ornaments were kind of scattered so that they could dry. So I was like shoving them out the way, get this car in the garage. Thank goodness we didn't have uh, broken windows from those cars, but just all of it, all of it made me, I just feel like I was all over the place for the week. So coming back this weekend, at the moment it's 22 degrees. <laughs> Ridiculous. Um, 
I just feel like I needed some breathing space, so here we are. And I have managed this weekend to sit down and journal. And that has been a really cathartic thing to do. I've been thinking a lot about what do I want to change in my life? What has changed? What's changed over the last month? Especially in the way that we're doing business and also the fact that the Bank of England base rate did go up to 4% and whilst I can see a lot of people in shock, uh, I don't think we're at the top of the place, top of the place, top of the base rate I think will be going up to about 4.5% and that will probably be where it lies. Uh, inflation is is curbing which is great but at the same time when the Bank of England base rate moves we have to adjust accordingly. It's not like the market stays the same, especially in the commercial world. And so I wanted to go through the 10 things I've changed about how I'm operating in property this year. And this is a reflection on what happened in January. So the first one is making more offers at level at the level I've appraised in my deal analysis and not feeling embarrassed about it. I'm never embarrassed about putting in offers, but it takes a lot of mindset work to convince clients that, you know what, an offer is just an offer and it's just us showing our position. So from that point of view, I am encouraging all of our clients to just put in offers, put in offers. Every time you see a building that you remotely like, remotely like, do a deal analysis, put in an put in an offer where you get to in the deal analysis. Who cares if it's 100 grand lower? Who cares if it's 200 grand grand lower? Go and offer. That's really important. The more offers you put in, the more likely you are to succeed in buying a property. Simple as. So that's a massive change. Whereas last year I would have been like, oh, I know there's so many people in the market doing this kind of stuff you know, we're so far under, this property will be snapped up in cash. I don't believe that anymore for a second. Do not believe that anymore for a second. So uh, that's a big change. There's not as many market players, so why not give it a go? Number two, explaining how I've got to an offer if the seller's agent comes back and says no. Oh, this one's a biggie. I didn't used to explain myself mainly because again there was a lot more people in the market so there wouldn't be time to explain yourself if it was if it was a no usually the seller's agent would have a buyer lined up and that's it they didn't care now we have time again I repeat there's not as many people in the market so a seller's agent actually would now like to hear how you've got to your position and even if they don't want to hear how you've got to your position if they come back and say no do you know what you do you say well look this is where I am and this is how I've got to where I am and you can record a video or I do it on Vimeo showing how I did my deal appraisal or you could simply put it in in bullet points you do you here and say I'm not moving until I can get an understanding from your client as to why you think it's higher. It doesn't make you look incompetent. It means you have done research. You have got yourself to where the, where you think the purchase price should be based upon the evidence that you have found if they are hiding other evidence or they have other evidence that they have based their sale price on, this is their opportunity to let you know. There you go. And then you can either take it into account or you can completely discount it. And again, that's your prerogative based upon how much you want to pay for a property. But don't be scared to have these conversations. A surveyor isn't looking badly at you. It's not as if we are judging each other. We don't judge each other at all. It's just someone's professional opinion or it's a buyer's opinion, you know? So don't feel ashamed that you might be in the wrong place. Don't 
get upset, don't get angry. It is what it is. Just say it in layman's terms, level terms. This is where we are. There you go. Explain yourself. Have that conversation. You're more than likely to get something under offer at a price that you want to pay for it. Number three, deal appraising on four to six month void periods and six month rent free. So I've upped our, when we do a deal analysis, I uh, I bake in void periods when we're offering on a deal. And I used to bake in three to four, four month voids I now bake in four to six month voids if I do market research and can see or if I do of course I do market research when I do market research if I see that it's suggesting a longer void period then of course I'll put a longer void period in but as a standard I start at a four to six month void period and a six month rent free tenants of bigger office spaces or bigger retail spaces and I'm talking the 800 plus square feet um that kind of size for office spaces we're looking at more about two and a half thousand square feet so big office spaces bigger than average retail units we're looking at giving six months rent free to get those tenants in at the moment. So we bake that into the deal appraisal. Used to be uh, three months, but we have just upped that. Number four, at the moment, I'm factoring for 10% interest rates. Even though the market isn't that high yet, the market is not showing 10% interest rates on lending. Apart from if you've got a bad credit score, then you might be up there in the 10% or you're using bridging. I bake it in any way based upon the market uncertainty of the base rate just going up. I think it's really important. Look, you might get, you you probably get lending at better rates than that. I just think you should be appraising your deal based on worst case scenario. That then gives you some wiggle room when you're negotiating anyway, right? So just make sure that you're baking in those higher interest rates on lending. Number five, coming back to deals that we looked at six months ago and re-offering at a lower rate. I think I've said it before in this podcast that as the Bank of England base rate goes up, the yields that you're offering on, on commercial property should go up too, which means that commercial properties are less expensive. For those of you that have come to my masterclasses recently, you'll have also heard this, which means that properties are a lower value than they were six months ago. That's fine. Swings and roundabouts, people, for uh, all of you who are now thinking, oh, I could have possibly buy a commercial property that's gone down in value. No, ignore it. Um, that's why commercial property runs in five-year cycles you don't really want to be valuing every single year unless you've made big changes usually you sit on it for five years and then revalue after that so if you bought last year and it's dropped slightly you shouldn't really have to worry about it for another four and a half years right but if a property has been sat on the market for six months and it's not sold you would expect that price to have dropped a seller is not going to get what they would have got on the market six months ago so I I am adjusting our offer prices accordingly and putting those in and seeing where we get to and um, that also means that you have to keep a really good record of what you look at we capture every single deal that we look at and we do a, de- a quick deal appraisal on them yes or no we put it in a column for come back to in six months time or it's not good at all. That's a really, really handy way of keeping track of all the deals that you look at. And so from that point of view, go back and look at those ones that you said you'd come back to in six months time. Offer lower, you never know. If you thought it was interesting at the time, well, it probably is still interesting right now. So why not? Why not give it a good offer? Number six, offering step rents and break penalties. So we're seeing tenants try and negotiate a little bit more uh, based upon 
the cost of running business right now. What we're seeing is stepped rents and that means that overall uh, the rents will average out to market rent but maybe they'll have a bit of a discount at the start and then a higher rent uh, later on in the lease. So that helps tenants to be able to come in, cement their trading position and then um, as trading improves they can then afford to pay that higher rent. So that's a something that's pretty standard that we're seeing tenants come in and ask us for at the moment. If they want a break clause in that stepped rent, we are saying you can have the break clause, but you have to pay us the amount that would get us up to market rent for that period. So if we've offered a discount in the step rent, um, for example, maybe year one, we're at £5,000, but the market rent's actually at 6000 the break's at year two, um, then we'd want that extra thousand pounds to get out to market rent at if they broke in year two. So there would be no discount given to them for that. And that's a good negotiation tactic. Also means that they would only use the break clause if they absolutely had to. Uh, great tactic for le leasing and letting right now. Really good. And tenants seem to be okay with it. Seven, purchasing neighbouring properties. We're doing a lot more of this, asking the people in or asking the landlords next door if they're selling uh, and purchasing. That means that we've got more control over an area, which means that we can put our stamp on an area. So rather than thinking, oh, there's nothing in the market, nothing I want to buy, buy next door. Ask the landlord if they're selling. We're certainly doing a lot of that. We are also talking to the agents that we deal with when we purchase and saying, hey, have you got anything that we could potentially uh, buy in the surrounding area as well? It's a really good tactic, easy tactic, uh, especially if you're getting to know your neighbouring landlords and managing agents. Number eight, knowing that multi-let properties take six to 12 months to sort out from the date of purchase. Interesting, right? It's something you have to be okay with. You don't just buy properties, expect it to go up in value straight away. You do actually have to put a little bit of work in. And it takes a bit of time to sort out, but that's all right. That's part of the property journey. And sometimes it takes longer than we expect because we uncover things that we may have not anticipated. But again, it's being okay with that. And it's knowing that property is a journey. We're not in property for the short term. We're in property for the long term. So with that in mind, how can we make sure that we're okay to hold on to this property for 12 months and to be sorting out the pro all the problems in that time? Something we've got to do. Number nine diarising more tenant meetings so that we can find out how they're operating and make changes accordingly. This is important. Make sure that you're talking to your tenants regularly. Put in that time. As asset managers, we do that with our, with our tenants where it's, where it's needed. If you don't have asset managers or property managers, you're going to have to do it yourself. But connect create that relationship. That relationship is going to be what makes those tenants want to stay in the building and build with you. It's vital, especially in times where it's hard. Don't hide from these tenants. Make sure that these tenants trust you enough to have honest conversations because that's going to be how you make the most of your money. And finally, number 10. I'm doing a lot more of trusting my gut rather than just relying on figures and I implore you to do the same if something doesn't feel right it normally isn't and more and more I get that with sellers trying to sell above where the market is and make out that everything's fine it may not be and if your gut is telling you that it may not be, I suggest you go with it and either dig a little bit deeper or just back off. 
I know that's it's kind of, that's more thinking with your heart than your head, but you can tell a lot by the way that someone speaks to you. And that, or the mannerisms that someone cr- comes across with often is far more telling than what your paper says or what your Excel spreadsheet says. Please trust that a bit more because people are hiding things about compliance. Always make sure that you go in and check that that building is compliant um, or that you have the funds to do it and make it compliant um, and have a look at figures. And if you ask for something and they don't give it, start questioning why. That is so vital. So we have it. Those are the 10 things that I'm changing right now in the way that I'm dealing with properties and being in the industry. Really, it's just improving my practice. And that takes time as well. You know, as much as I position myself as an expert, and I am an expert, I always, always challenge myself to go harder, to be better, to improve what I'm doing. I was thinking about this in terms of my goals this week, and I don't know if anybody, or if you you follow my Instagram, and if you don't, that's fine. Uh, my Instagram is uh, very much uh, it really is very much me just talking about what I do um, on a personal level but I put something in the comment section of my recent post that I posted out yesterday which was the 5th of uh, no the 4th of February actually and it was about how I design my life I always look at small goals consistency, patience, move on to bigger goals, consistency, patience. It's not about getting it everything all the time. Life is a learning curve. It's not like you get to a certain place and you're done. You're always going to have to be making certain tweaks. And I put that post in terms of the fact that over the last 12 months, I've been really working on my fitness journey. And I had to start by simply getting my body in a good state of repair, you know, healthy, That was goal number one, healthy, healthy enough to be able to move. And then going to the next goal, which was being able to do uh, body weight exercises. And then the next goal, which was small weights and building up to them being able to run and then and now being able to pick up the 25 pound dumbbells you know and bench press 50 pounds I would never have been able to do that last year but it's these small steps that you do and you know being able to run a 5k and being proud of the small goals life is a work in progress and if you are not okay with constantly tweaking and constantly making yourself better you're never going to improve or hit your goals I just want to say that in that we all get to do it all the time and I want to share my learnings with you, which I have done today. But I want you to think about that as well. How can you tweak? How can you improve? What can you, What are you doing differently which is making big changes and big differences to your life? Something to think about. 